I am Matthew. The joint work with Carl and uh, Shiva. Uh, uh, thanks, Yogesh. Thanks, um, and also thanks to Shiva for giving an excellent first talk. Uh, that makes my job very easy. Um, so I'm going to uh, just focus on uh, a specific uh, a stochastic partial differential equation, the stochastic heat equation, which is a, a random field U depending on time and space. Okay. Time uh, greater than or equal to zero and uh, space will be uh, I'm going to restrict myself to the interval zero one. Okay. So um, the stochastic heat equation uh, looks like this. So you have the derivative of u. So derivative of u tx, but I, I write it like this, is one half double derivative of u plus sigma tx u times white noise. Okay, so this is white noise. Okay, so I, I've written sigma tx u, but what I mean is sigma tx u tx. Okay, uh, and uh, since I'm working on the interval, I'm going to look at uh, periodic boundary conditions. Periodic boundary conditions. And my initial profile, so this is what the solution is at time zero, are denoted by u sub zero. So this is my stochastic equation. Okay. Um, so let me uh, let me tell you a bit about white noise. I won't go too much into detail. Uh, so white noise, uh, you can think of it as a noise which is independent in different regions of space and time. Okay, in disjoint regions of space and time, uh, you have independent noise. Okay, so um, a bit more precisely, so white noise, or if you look at a set A in space and time, um, so W of A, think of this as the integral of w dot tx dx dt, this would be a normal random variable with mean zero and variance given by the Lebesgue measure of the set A. Okay. Uh, and uh, if I look at uh, two sets A and B, the covariance of W A W B is simply the Lebesgue measure of the intersection of A and B. Okay, so if you if A and B are disjoint, uh, the covariance of W A W B is zero, which uh, says that W A and W B are independent. Okay, since so these are Gaussian uh, random variables. Uh, so this is white noise. Uh, so Obviously, if you if you have a noise which is very rough, like white noise, you don't expect uh, the solutions to star to be you know uh, differentiable in time or differentiable in space. Um, so, what do I mean by a, a solution of star? What I uh, sorry, Patani has a question. So, Shiva, I guess Shiva will. Um, uh, what do I mean by periodic boundary conditions? What I mean is uh, u of one is equal to u of zero for all time, okay? So, um, uh, right, so I don't expect a solution to start being uh, uh, differentiable in time or space. So what do I mean? Uh, so if w was a very nice function, uh, then uh, a solution to star would satisfy by the Duhamel principle uh, I'll, I'll explain all this uh, what I mean by these uh, terms so 
zero to one. Psi sigma s y two s i w d y d s. Okay. Um, okay. So w d y d s you can think of it as w dot s y uh, times d y d s. Okay. Uh, so, so this is a uh, Duhamel's principle. So here, uh, G T X Y is the heat curl on zero one. So that is the sum over n in Z. Et y minus x plus n. Okay, and Pt is the heat kernel on uh, the real line. So that's one over square root of two pi t exponential minus x square over two t. Okay, uh, and uh, the first term here. That is the space convolution of the heat kernel with the initial profile. Okay, so uh, G T star U zero of X is the integral zero to one G T X Y U uh, zero Y dy okay okay so um let me just start uh, th this second term here uh, is something we'll focus on a lot so let me just uh, denote this by n t x okay. okay so by a solution to star i would mean a solution to this uh, do, uh this this thing here okay uh, now, uh, you know, uh, so you can uh, white noise when you're integrating over a set, uh, you know what it, you, you can, you know, it's normal zero one and uh, reasonably nice functions when you integrate with respect to white noise, you can make sense of that. Uh, so um, I'm not going to uh, show this here, but under some conditions on sigma, one can show that there is a solution uh, to star, okay, which satisfies this equation for all t and x, okay. Uh, yeah, and, and this equality is almost shown here. Okay? In particular, if I assume that uh, sigma is Lipschitz, so let me state the assumptions on sigma. Uh, so we will assume that sigma is Lipschitz in the third variable, Rtxv is less than or equal to some constant v multiplied by u minus v. Okay, um, and one can show that under these assumptions, uh, existence, uh, uniqueness of solutions to star. Uh, holes. Okay. Okay. Right. So we will assume this, and I'll need one more condition, uh, which is that sigma is uniformly elliptic. So what do I mean? I mean that there exist two constants c1 and c2, such that this holds for all t, x, and u. So these are the only two conditions I assume. The first condition is uh, sort of necessary for existence uniqueness. Uh, the second condition is, uh, uh, yeah, is the extra condition that we need. So here is 
a result. So this is the small ball uh, probability result for the stochastic heat equation. So consider the solution star starting with initial profile zero. Okay, so by this I mean that u is u zero is uh, equal to zero everywhere. So the first statement is that if my Lipschitz constant, the script D is small enough, okay? And my epsilon is also small enough. Then I have, okay, so this is it. If I consider the probability that the soup of UTX up to time capital T and uh, X between zero and one, is less than epsilon, okay? So this is my uh, small ball probability. I have upper and lower bounds of the same form. So uh, the lower bound is C0, exponential, minus C1T, epsilon to the power six, and the upper bound is of the same form. So, C2 exponential minus C3 T epsilon to the power six. Okay. So uh, one can compare this with the Brownian motion result. So Brownian motion, you have just time uh, and uh, you have exponential epsilon to the power minus two. Here it's epsilon to the power minus six. Okay. Uh, all the constants here the C0, C1, C2, C3, as well as D0 and epsilon zero, depend only on uh, script C1 and script C2. Okay, so, so they depend only on script C1 and C2. Okay. Uh, so we have this uh, result only when the Lipschitz constant, the script D is small enough, okay? Uh, but uh, if we want to look at any D, so that's the second statement. Uh, so if I fix D uh, and delta, okay, then for epsilon less than epsilon zero, again, I'm looking at uh, probability. So uh, of less than or equal to epsilon. Okay. So again, is the soup over uh, time less than capital T and uh, space between zero and one. Okay. This, uh, the upper bound is similar as before. So we have C2 exponential minus C3T divided by uh, one plus D squared times epsilon to the power six, okay? Uh, but the lower bound is not the same anymore. So lower bound, you have C0 exponential minus C1 T epsilon to the power six plus delta. Okay. We expect the lower bound also to be the same, you know, exponential to the power one over epsilon to the power six, but somehow our arguments don't, uh, are not able to show that. We're not able to show that. Okay. So um, here again, the constant C0, C1, C2, C3, they only depend on script C1 and script C2. Uh, the epsilon zero uh, depends additionally on uh, the script D and the delta. 
okay so this is our result um, i'll i'll give you an idea of uh, of the proof in a, in a very simple case um, but i'll also mention that a, a consequence of this result of which i'm not uh, i'm not going to discuss the proof is a support theorem Um, so basically what the support theorem says is that uh, if your initial profile, uh, okay, so you, you have a function HTX, uh, which is reasonably nice. And if your initial profile is within uh, epsilon over two of H zero X, okay. So this is so over X. Uh, and my function h is reasonably nice in the sense that uh, the derivatives in time and space, the first derivative in time and the first two derivatives in space, uh, they are uniformly bounded. Uh, then what we can show is that uh, we have uh, bounds on the probability that u is within epsilon of h. And the bounds that we have are exactly the same as in the small ball probability theorem. So if d is small enough, you have exponential minus epsilon to the power minus six on both sides. If uh, for arbitrary d, uh, you have a result similar to the second statement. Um, so this is um, the support theorem. So I, I'm not going to discuss uh, the proof of this, but what I'd like to do in the remaining time uh, is to give a rough idea in a very simple case of the uh, small ball probability result. Okay. Um, so um, for the rest of the talk, I'm only going to consider the case when sigma is identically one. Okay. Um, the general case is uh, a bit more complicated, and uh, so I'm not going to discuss that. Uh, but you know, the, you you will have a basic idea of how the argument goes. Um, so sigma is identically one. Uh, one can show that under this case, uh, my solution is Gaussian. And sigma is identically one. Okay, so I am going to uh, restrict myself to this case. Right. Okay, and uh, so again, I'll just like Shiva, I'll first show the upper bound, and then I will show the lower bound. And you'll see a similarity with the argument that Shiva had provided. Okay, so um, let me. First, go to the upper bound. Uh, so here, um, uh, I'm going to focus on the function n, n t x. Remember, this was the second term. Um, let me just go back and uh, remind you what N was, uh, N was uh, this one, this, this here, the noise term, okay? Uh, so let's focus on that. What one can show is that uh, N is uh, holder uh, one half minus in space just like Brownian motion. And in time, it is holder uh, one fourth minus, okay? It's almost holder one fourth. Okay. Um, so one can make this a bit precise, but let me just leave it like that. Um, so, so if you remember the argument of Shiva for the upper bound, what he did was he um, 
had the time interval zero to capital T, which he divided uh, into small increments of length epsilon square, uh, and looked at the values at the endpoints of the increments. Okay. Uh, now, since uh, NTX is holder one half in space, one fourth in time. Uh, that uh, suggests that we divide uh, our time interval. So my y-axis is time and my x-axis is space. So zero to one. Uh, since we are looking at small ball pr probabilities, uh, you know, up to epsilon. Uh, so, and uh, because of this holder uh, conditions, um, that suggests that we divide our space into uh, intervals of length epsilon square. Okay. Um, so I'm going to uh, look at C1 epsilon square. C1 is a constant that I will discuss later. Okay. Um, so these are my spatial endpoints. Uh, time, I look at epsilon to the power four. Okay. So epsilon to the power four and so on. Okay. So just discretizing, just like uh, what she was doing. Okay. And I call Pij to be I epsilon to the power four J C one epsilon square. Okay, so these are these points here. Okay. So my first uh, first coordinate is time. My second coordinate is space. Okay. All yeah. All the way I drew the uh, drew this, it's, it doesn't seem that. Uh, seen that way but yeah my first coordinate is time okay so um pij i epsilon to the power four might be somewhere there uh and jc1 epsilon square might be somewhere there so it would be this part okay so uh clearly the probability that the soap of u in this entire strip is less than epsilon is bounded up above by the probability that sup uh, upij is less than epsilon sup over ing okay so i goes from uh, uh, zero to t over epsilon to the power four right so i goes from zero one to up to t to the power epsilon to the power four and j goes from 0, 1 up to uh, 1 over c1 epsilon square. Okay. So clearly this, this holds because um, uh, the left hand probability you are uh, requiring that at all the points the value is less than epsilon. Whereas the right hand side you're just requiring that at these discrete points you are less than epsilon. Okay, so this is clearly true. Um, and I'm going to write this uh, as the probability that I goes from one to P over epsilon to the power four uh, probability FI uh, given F zero up to F I minus one. Okay, here uh, FI is, uh, you're looking at the ith uh, time strip, right? Uh, and you require that u p i j is less than epsilon for all j equal to 0, 1, 2, 2, c1 epsilon square. Okay, so this is clearly true, right? Uh, conditional probabilities. Um, so we need a control on the right hand side. Uh, what I'll show. Um, is that uniformly 
in the initial profile the probability of f1 is less than or equal to sum eta to the power 1 over c1 epsilon square okay so eta is some number less than 1 eta is uh, let me just write uh, eta less than 1 Now, uh, the stochastic heat equation, just like Brownian motion, it has the Markov property. Uh, so, if I show the claim, I've shown that starting from any initial profile, the probability at this time, at each of these points, you are less than epsilon, is like eta to the eta to the power one over C one epsilon square. Okay. And then, so that means this conditional probability is bounded by eta to the power one over C one epsilon square for each I. Okay. So then uh, the number of I's is T over epsilon to the power four. So you get the result. So, um, so, are there any questions on this? Is, is this okay? Okay, so, so the key point is that this is uniformly in the initial profile. Okay, so starting from here, uh, you reach here you have the bound eta to the power one over C one epsilon square. Now start with this profile, it might be random, no problem. Just go up to two epsilon to the power four. And again, you have the same bound. And so uh, you just need to raise this quantity to the number of i's and the number of i's is E epsilon to the power four. Okay. Okay. So um, that's what we need to show. So um, just, uh, I'll just give you a rough idea of how this goes. Um, so um, UP1J, right? So I'm just looking at I equal to one, starting with initial profile u zero. This is d epsilon to the power four star u zero at the spatial point g c one epsilon square plus the noise term, which is which I denoted by n at p one j. Okay. Uh, so one can show uh, that the variance of n p one j n p one j so it's not p i p one j is a constant epsilon square. Okay. And also, um, the covariance between these adjacent points decreases as you let C1 uh, increase. So as C1 goes to infinity, so these spatial points become very far apart and the covariance decays to zero, okay? So let me, let me just write it this way. Uh, you, we have a, also a quantitative uh, rate of decay, but uh, I'll just write NP1J 
and p1 j prime is very close to zero if c1 is very large okay so roughly what's happening is that these n p1 js um these are all gaussian random variables um of variance epsilon square and they sort of become independent as you let c1 large enough okay i'm not being precise but they become somewhat independent uh so uh again so roughly what that implies is that uh if i compute this probability which is that at each of these p1 js you are less than epsilon this is okay again i'm not being precise it's sort of looking at independent random variables and you require that and so since they are roughly independent it's roughly uh like this okay so you can it's roughly a product okay now look at uh, up1j it is a center gaussian random variable plus a deterministic quantity okay um now a gaussian uh, so this probability this probability uh would be maximized uh when the deterministic term is zero right uh so uh this is clearly less than the product 1 divided by sorry the product 1 to uh c1 epsilon square inverse of probability n p1 j less than or equal to epsilon okay okay so um n p1 j has variance epsilon square uh right so it has variance epsilon square so the probability that it is um at most epsilon is bounded by some eta which is less than 1 okay so um this gives you the eta to the power 1 over c1 epsilon square so here for this for this you need that uh, the variance so the fact that you can give a uniform bound like this uh you need that the variance of n p1 j is of order epsilon square so i proved my claim and this shows the the small ball probability the upper bound okay so the next thing i have i think uh yeah 10 10 15 minutes so i'm going to uh, discuss the lower bound uh, so again i should mention i should emphasize that the argument that i showed here is uh only in the gaussian case when sigma is identically one or sigma is some deterministic function it is not true uh when you uh when you have uh, sigma depending on u okay so that's that's an important remark so above uh only when sig sigma tx u uh depends only on t and x okay so i i have assumed that sigma is equal to 1 but a similar sort of argument can be carried over if sigma depends on t and x but it's deterministic uh uh it gets much more a, a bit more com complicated i wouldn't say much more but if all you also have the u then uh things are not gaussian okay so uh so then u not 
mercy. Okay, so that, that's a very important point. Okay. Um, so let me let me go to the lower bound. Yeah, also this, uh, the fact that I can write uh, this as a product of uh, probabilities. So somehow we have used uh, our proof uses Gaussianity. Okay, so. Um, Okay, so let me go to the lower bound. Uh, so here is the key calculation. Probability, the SUP X in zero one, NTX is less than or equal to epsilon over two this is greater than the probability the soup t less than or equal to epsilon to the power four. Remember that my uh, function n is holder one half in space and holder one fourth in time. So if you want to see fluctuations of order epsilon, uh, you will have to look at um, a spatial interval of uh, order epsilon squared. Uh, okay, in any way, any case, um, what is true is that uh, this probability is greater than uh, this probability to the power one over epsilon squared. Okay. And for this, we used a, uh, use this Gaussian correlation inequality. So this, this is a result which was proved only recently after, I think uh, it, was, it was conjectured, I think uh, 50 years ago, but it was only proved recently. Um, so what it states is that um, for any closed symmetric sets KL in RD, and mu a centered uh, Gaussian measure on RD, okay. centered Gaussian, uh, then the probability under mu of K intersection L is greater than the product mu K mu L. Okay. Uh, So if you look at uh, these events, uh, these events, uh, so you split your space interval into uh, intervals of length epsilon square uh, and look at this interval, look at this, uh, sorry, look at this uh, uh, event. Uh, these events would, they are all closed, they're symmetric, okay? And so the Gaussian correlation inequality says that you can um, do this, okay? So one has to be a bit uh, careful here. I mean, the Gaussian correlation inequality as stated is only for a Gaussian measure on RD, but what you can do uh, over here is that you can, uh, Instead of looking at all t and x, you can just look at a very really fine, uh, uh, sorry, very really fine discretization of t and x. Uh, okay, so so this is time zero epsilon four, and that is zero one. Uh, you want n at all these points to be less than epsilon over two. You divide your spatial increment, a spatial interval into increments epsilon square. Right? And uh, use the Gaussian correlation inequality. 
and it's also important that my function n is continuous okay so n is continuous okay so gaussian uh, correlation inequality will say that the probability the sup over n at all these uh, points less than epsilon over 2 is greater than the probability sup of n here is less than epsilon over 2 multiplied by the probability the sup over n here is less than epsilon over 2 and so on and then you let the mesh go to zero okay okay so if you don't uh, remember anything from my talk at least you can remember this this is a very useful result i think uh, because of this uh, one can expect uh, uh, you know uh, at least the theory of small ball probabilities to you know there's a big i think there's a big uh, ingredient in uh, this small ball probability literature so, yeah so, okay anyway moving on so um, this is what we uh, have uh, and uh, as i said n uh, uh, in a in a time interval of length epsilon 4 and space interval of length epsilon square you expect n to vary um, of order epsilon okay so uh, as a result of which you can uh, show that uh, this is um, greater than eta to the power some eta tilde to the power epsilon square where eta tilde is greater than zero Okay, so this is the key calculation and let me just uh, in the remaining time, uh, let me just uh, give you an idea of how uh, I can prove my lower bound using this. Okay, so uh, the key calculation is that the probability the sup of n less than epsilon over 2 is greater than this. Okay, uh, so it's sort of like what Shiva did. Uh, I consider the event A1, which is the sup e less than epsilon to the power 4 in 0 1 utx less than or equal to epsilon okay so up to time epsilon to the power 4 you are at most epsilon but you also require that at the terminal time which is at epsilon to the power 4 you are less than epsilon over two. But this should hold everywhere. Right, it's so, sort of what she worried. Um, and the claim is that uniformly, in my initial profile, satisfying uh, less than epsilon over two, okay? P u zero A one is greater than eta to the power one over epsilon square. Okay? So initially, of course, you are starting at zero. So you start at zero. Uh, A one tells me that at time uh, epsilon 4, you are within epsilon over 2. Okay, so your profile at time epsilon over 4 is within epsilon over 2. Now, if I can show my claim, then starting with that profile, the profile at time epsilon to the power 4, you again look at the next time increment, then up to 2 epsilon to the power 4. So in that time in increment, again, the probability of A1 is at least eta to the power one over epsilon square. So just use the Markov property to get the lower bound. Okay, so uh, it's extremely crucial that at the terminal time, you are within epsilon over two. Okay, so that is why I am doing that. Okay, so this is very important.
Um, so um, as Shiva mentioned, the idea is to use Gersanov. So basically um, what we do is, uh, let me just write down UTX again. Uh, UTX is, um, let me write UTX in a different way right now. So I will write this as one minus T over epsilon to the power four, uh, GT star U zero X plus the integral zero to T, integral zero to one, uh, GT minus S X Y, W D Y D S plus G S star U zero Y uh, epsilon to the power four. Okay, D Y D S. Okay. Uh, so this this is true. Uh, the reason why this is true is that if you um, look at uh, the convolution, this uh, convolution of uh, G T minus S with G S, you get uh, G T. Okay. Uh, so this is true. Uh, I've just written things in a different way. So the key idea is to find a measure Q such that this expression here is a white noise under Q. So that's the key idea. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what the measure is, but it looks similar to the one that Shiva had written. Uh, you can probably even um, you know, make, a, make an educated guess. Um, so to find a measure which, under which this quantity is white noise. Okay. So under the measure Q, this is like your N, N tilde. And N tilde because um, it's a it's a different white noise. So we have uh, we have the probability that the N tilde is at most epsilon over two. We have a control of that. Uh, but what about this term? The key observation is that you are start first. Of all, note that you are starting with u0 less than epsilon over 2. So therefore, the first term is up to time epsilon to the power 4 is at most uh, epsilon over 2. And at time epsilon to the power 4, it is equal to 0. Right, because of that. So to get a control of, of this uh, under the measure Q is equivalent, uh, well, not equivalent, but really so to get a measure a control of this event under the measure Q boils down to getting a control of this event being less than epsilon over two under the measure Q, which we already have. Okay. So I'll just write to you quickly. So, so N tilde TX less than or equal to epsilon over two, we showed that it's in eta tilde to the power one over epsilon squared. Okay. Um, so Q of A1 uh, is equal to uh, expected value. This is expected value under P, DQ by DP, indicator of A1. Cauchy-Schwarz tells me that this is dq over dp square, the square root of that multiplied by the square root of p of a1. Uh, this I know. Uh, 
this is uh, greater than or equal to um, equal to the power one over epsilon square. Uh, one, one can also show that this term is less than or equal to exponential one over epsilon square, some constant maybe, okay? So that's how uh, one can get a lower bound on that. Okay, so uh, I think I'll stop here. I, I just mentioned that uh, this, I've shown you only uh, uh, the result in the Gaussian case, the rough argument, I mean. Um, so um, uh, just a reminder for the, uh, for the lower bound, I really needed the Gaussian correlation inequality. So that works only for Gaussian random variables. And for the upper bound, uh, showing this part, uh, we really used the fact that it is Gaussian. Okay. Um, for a general sigma, we use some sort of an approximation argument. Uh, but yeah, so. Uh, well, if, if you if you don't remember anything from this talk, at least uh, just remember this uh, Gaussian correlation correlation inequality. I think it's it's quite useful. Okay, I think I'll stop here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks, Matthew. I think uh, everybody can unmute themselves and give a round of applause to Matthew. Okay, um, Matthew, uh, so before other questions, I think most on the chat have been answered, but as you said, the Gaussian correlation inequality, uh, symmetric means centrally symmetric. Is that correct or? Yes, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. centrally symmetric, of course, yeah. That is if X belongs to K and minus X also belongs to K. Belongs to K, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's all. Okay, great. Uh, I think rest mostly Shiva has been answered, but if anybody, uh, uh, some question not answered in the chat, people can ask themselves and even other questions. Please unmute yourself and ask. So, Sarvesh had a question, so he should ask. Matthew, can you see uh, Sarvesh on chat? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's just. Uh, the fact that we have uh, this, uh, let, me, let me go back. So we have this, uh, this Lipschitz, uh, Lipschitz constant, right? So if uh, U is not very far from V, uh, you don't expect uh, the noise term coming from the Sigma TX U to be uh, very far from uh, the noise term coming from the Sigma TX V. Okay, so um, essentially what we do is, uh, so we have this, uh, uh, yeah, so, so if you look at the upper and the lower bound argument, uh, I am using the Markov property. So I'm just looking at the, uh, the behavior of the solution in each of these time increments. Uh, so I, uh, so yeah, and then I use the Markov property and, uh, do it all the way up to the terminal time. So, um, if I look at the first time increment, uh, so I am interested in the evolution of u times w, right? The stochastic heat equation in the in the uh, time interval epsilon to the power four. Um, so if I just erase some, um, erase this part. Yeah. So let, let me just write it once more. Okay. So um, so I am looking at uh, u t x w dot. Okay. Um, so in the time interval zero to epsilon to the power four. So what I do is I compare this with uh, u tilde, which is one half dx square u tilde plus sigma tx u zero x w. 
Okay. Uh, now this is now deterministic. So you are taking your u zero to be fixed. So this becomes a deterministic function in the time interval zero to epsilon to the power four. Uh, but since uh, my solution to the stochastic heat equation in the time epsilon to the power four, it cannot vary too much. I mean, it's holder one fourth, right? So you expect UTX to not be very far from U zero X. Okay. Um, so somehow one has to, and uh, by this Lipschitz assumption, you can control the difference of the contribution from the noise term coming from this and the noise term coming from that. Okay. Uh, if D is very large, uh, the difference is too much, more than epsilon. But if the D is small enough, the difference is not, is, is, is within, uh, within uh, what we can handle, right? So that's, that's really the idea.